Before I get started, I just want to apologize. I do have a little bit of a cold, and my nose is stopped up, um, and my voice is a little raspy, so I apologize if my words are not very clear in this video. Just let me know if you have any questions. Today we're going to learn about Gibbs free energy and how it relates to equilibrium. So what we know about delta G so far, we know that it must be a negative number for a reaction to proceed in a given direction, and we know that it's the maximum amount of work that can be done by a system. So today we're going to learn that a system at equilibrium, when it is no longer um, able to do any work, the delta G is going to equal zero. Although forward and reverse reactions continue to take place at equilibrium, net changes in concentration are not going to be possible, and we're going to look at how KEQ and delta G are related. So we're going to start by looking at our graph here. On our y-axis, we have the actual free energy available in the chemicals that are taking part in the chemical reaction, the combined G for the reactants and the products at any point in time. The difference in free energy, or delta G um, superscript zero, with the, that's at standard conditions, um, is the maximum amount of free energy available to do work when all of the reactants are converted into products. Now, as you can see from the graph, that is not what happens as our equilibrium lies somewhere between 100% reactants and 100% products. In this case, it looks like we have about 80% products and 20% reactants when the system reaches equilibrium. From a thermodynamic point of view, the reason why it only makes 80% of the way to completion, if we start with only A, is because the reaction will continue in the forward direction so long as the free energy is being released. The reaction continues while delta G is negative and the entropy of the universe is increasing. Once the reaction hits the equilibrium point, it would need to experience an increase in G in order to continue to increase the concentration of B. Um, our equation, our, if we look at the change in G, change in free energy, that's going to equal our final free energy minus our initial free energy, and that would give us a positive value for delta G, causing a decrease in the entropy of the universe. The universe simply wouldn't allow this to happen. So at equilibrium, forward and reverse reactions continue to take place. However, the concentrations of the reactants and the products remain the same. A change in concentration would produce a positive delta G value. Now, the same is true if we start with all products, or B. So long as we are moving down the slope toward equilibrium, delta G is going to be less than zero. So our change in energy, our final minus our initial, is going to be less than zero. Thus, if we start with all products, this system will proceed to the same equilibrium position. Once it gets there, it will stay there, as any changes in concentration would reduce the entropy of the universe. So when delta G is less than zero, the process favors the products, the equilibrium. So KEQ would be greater than one. The reaction is going to proceed to equilibrium in either direction, and the reaction is, is said to be exergonic. Exergonic means that delta G is less than zero. In this reaction, the calculated delta G value would be positive, which would um, have us conclude that the reaction is not thermodynamically favored. However, the reaction is therm thermodynamically favored between the point where there is 100% C and the equilibrium position. Delta G is the change in free energy as we move from all reactants to all products, but that is not what we are actually doing here. We're proceeding from all reactants to equilibrium. For that change, we move down the slope, and this gives us a negative value for delta G. So a positive delta G value means that we have mostly reactants at equilibrium. It does not mean that we have no products at equilibrium. So when delta G is greater than zero, the process favors the reactants at equilibrium, so KEQ would be less than 1. 
So the, the reaction will proceed to equilibrium in either direction, a process that is not therm thermodynamically favored, where delta G is greater than zero, will produce products if the system initially contains only reactants. If the products are removed, the equilibrium will shift in order to produce more products, so Chatelier's principle. So endergonic here means that delta G is greater than zero. Now delta G equals zero at equilibrium. This is because the forward and reverse reactions are still taking place, but there is no change in free energy. The system is no longer moving up or down the y-axis. This is the minimum value of the free energy of the curve right here in the valley. So what is delta G again? Our little um, degree sign means normal or at standard state. Remember that standard state for thermodynamic processes is um, 298 Kelvin and 1 ATM. Um, we can examine the difference in free energy between having 100% reactants and 100% products at other temperatures. Now the graphs that we looked at previously look exactly the same when the system is at other temperatures except that some people will say that um, delta G We'll call it delta G sub T to show that the temperature is not at standard conditions. Now the same equations that are used to find delta G can also be used to find delta G sub T. We can therefore assume that delta G only means that all gases are at 1 atm and all aqueous species have 1 molar concentrations. So now we're going to relate delta G to KEQ. We have this equation here. Um, this first equation where we have delta G equals negative RT ln KEQ. Um, that has always been given in the, in, um, on the AP exam. It's going to be used to solve for all variables except for KEQ. Now the second equation here is the same as the first. It's just a rearranged version so that you could solve for KEQ. Now this one has not been given on the AP exam so you either have to memorize it or you have to know how to rearrange this first equation to find it. Now notice what the constants mean and the units that go with them. Delta G is joules per mole. R is 8.314 joule per mole Kelvin. T has to be in Kelvin, your temperature. And you've got your KEQ. It's got to be calculated using partial pressures and molar concentrations. Um, well here we're going to estimate KEQ using our equation. Um, you will need to know this and you can ex expect to see these kind of questions in the multiple choice section of your exam. So at 298 Kelvin RT is going to be about 2400 joules per mole. So if we say that R equals about 8 um, times about 300 Kelvin, about 298, we get about 2400. Remember, you don't get to use a calculator, so you have to make these estimations. So if delta G is much, much greater than 2400 joules per mole, then K is going to be much, much less than 1. If 2400 joules per mole is greater than G, and that is greater than negative 2400 joules per mole, then K is going to be about 1. And then if it's much, much less than negative 2400 joules per mole, K is going to be much, much greater than 1. So we can use this to estimate our equilibrium position. So this table here is a summary uh, for estimating KEQ. If delta G is positive, then the system will contain mostly reactants when it reaches equilibrium. This will also mean that it will have a relatively small value, oops, sorry. This will also mean that it will have a relatively small value for KEQ because um, KEQ equals products over reactants. The more positive the value for delta G, the further to the left the equilibrium will lie. If delta G is negative, the system will contain mostly reactants when it reaches equilibrium. This will also mean that it will have a relatively large value for KEQ uh, because KEQ, remember, is products over reactants. The more negative the value for delta G, 
the further the equilibrium will lie to the right. So the delta G value can be used to determine the equilibrium position. So a question that you may see would look like this. For a certain reaction, delta H is negative 20 kilojoules and delta S is negative 100 joules per Kelvin. Which of the following statements provides the best description of the system at equilibrium? So what equations do we need to know to answer this question? Now, without using your calculators, we're going to have to estimate the value of delta G. So again, use that 300 Kelvin to estimate that it's close to 298 Kelvin. Now remember to change kilojoules to joules for delta H. Remember to make sure that all of your units are correct. Now from this, we can tell that the equilibrium system contains mostly reactants, but we can get a better idea of the equilibrium position by estimating KEQ. So what is the estimated value for delta G over RT that we would look for here? So what's the best answer here? Um, you do need to know that e to the 1 is 2.72 and e to the negative 1 is 0.37. Those are um, values that you, you should be familiar with and be able to estimate. So our answer for our multiple choice here is going to be D. The system is going to contain mostly reactants. Here's another example. Um, we've got delta H is negative 198 kilojoules per mole. Delta S is negative 188 joules per mole Kelvin. What's the value of Kp? Now this particular reaction is very common in the environment. Um, sulfur dioxide is produced during combustion of sulfur when you burn coal, oil, and gas. And then it, the sulfur dioxide reacts with oxygen in the air to produce sulfur trioxide. Um, that is going to then react with water in the air or in your lungs to form sulfuric acid. And this is con what contributes to acid rain and lung damage. Um, if you're in an area where there's lots of air pollution due to the burning of these fuels, then you'll be breathing in sulfuric acid or it'll form in your lungs. Now this reaction is exothermic, which is favorable, but it has a negative entropy value for the system because we have three moles of gas converted into two moles of gas. Now after doing these calculations, we'll be able to tell where the equilibrium lies. So in step one, we want to find delta G. Now again, a common mistake is with the units. Delta H is always given in kilojoules per mole. Delta S is given in joules per mole Kelvin. So we know that we need joules because R is 8.314 so, um, joules per mole Kelvin. So pay attention to your units and write them down as you're working them out. Okay, so make sure you make all of your unit conversions. So where is the equilibrium position for this reaction? Our delta G is much larger than negative 20 kilojoules, so the equilibrium is going to lie far to the right. Now we're finding Kp because we're looking at an equation involving gases. If we were looking um, for Kc, that would mean we, were, we had aqueous solutions. So what equation are we going to use? So what do we substitute in? Don't forget to pay attention to your units. Now, um, then when we solve this, we see that the equilibrium lies far to the right as we would expect from delta G. Now, most likely you'll never see this on the AP exam, but if the reaction contained gases and aqueous species, you would calculate an equilibrium constant using partial pressures for the gases and molar concentrations for the aqueous species, but they almost, they, they never um, combine the two of those. For this um, e example, we're using our ammonia formula here. We want to find K, we have KC, we want to find delta G. So what do we do? Um, KP has to be used for gases in the next step, even though we're given KC. So we need the formula that relates KP and KC. Now in this case, 
R is going to be 0.0821 liter ATM per mole Kelvin. Although KP doesn't have units, it is related to volume and pressure, so we need to use the constant with units of liters and ATM and not joules. Um, remember that delta N is moles of products minus moles of reactants. So delta N is going to be 2 minus 4, 3 plus 1, and so we get a negative 2 value there. So when we solve this um, equation, we get 36.5 for our KP value. And then step number two is to find delta G. So what equation are we going to use? We're going to use our delta G equals negative RT ln KEQ. And we're going to substitute in all of our numbers. Now delta G is a large negative number in kilojoules, so the equilibrium is going to lie to the right. The system contains mostly products at equilibrium, so if the value was negative 20 kilojoules or less, more negative in other words, we would say that the reaction went very close to completion. 